Great. Well, hello, Lisbon. Let's get right to it. We're talking here about Google in Europe. So obviously, that's a very small topic that will take us 20 minutes to fix. So you look at Google's role in Europe and EMEA, and there are, I, for me, there's a contradiction. We have almost everyone here will be using Google search, even right now, as they, they Google our names. Three out of four people in this room have an Android phone. So Google obviously has a, huge, a very large presence. But on the counterpoint, we've had a 2.4 billion euro antitrust fine this year, which you are appealing. There were questions around how Google uses privacy data, as well as sort of the, the tax structure that Google and others ha have in Europe. So I suppose my question is, with all that's going on for the good and for the bad, are you not concerned that at some point all those regulatory issues that you, you're facing is going to impinge the underlying business that, frankly, I, you, and everyone else in this uh, room use every day. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's really interesting seeing the Web Summit here, and it's fantastic to be with everybody. Uh, we've got some of the leading policymakers in the field coming here to engage with the industry. And I think that's one of the most important things that has to happen. You know, we have to work together with policymakers as an industry. Uh, to help everyone make the most of the digital economy and the digital opportunity. The, big, the, the, the three big trends that I see that are really important for us. Firstly, the connected population is going to double. You know, the next five years, we'll see a doubling of the internet population on the planet. We're going to go from the minority to the majority connected. Everyone here has probably got one, two, or even three connected devices with them. That's a huge opportunity for European entrepreneurs and everyday businesses. So I would say there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur, not just a tech entrepreneur, but an everyday business. Last night, I had dinner with a few um, Portuguese startups. One of them, Undandy, sells fantastic handmade shoes around the world using online. It was never possible before. So it's really important that we seize this opportunity and that the rules of the road are clear. And if we have uh, you know, questions asked of us, our objective is to be a good, you know, good citizen here. Uh, if we can make changes, we'll make changes to improve what we're doing so that Europeans can succeed online. And I would say you know, Google in Europe is now 14,000 people mostly Europeans, and we really want Europe to have the best possible shot at you know, being successful in this connected and digital world. So I think that's one of the things that I'm focused on, is making sure we engage, uh, respectfully engage. We might disagree with some of the, uh, some of the uh, questions or points of view, but to engage as a, as a constructive partner to help Europe succeed here. Mm. That makes all a lot of sense, right? And, and no one is saying that Google is you know, uh, not doing a lot to help the European digital uh, eco economy. But there is an ongoing wave of questions being asked, yeah. both from the European Commission, from, from um, policymakers at a, at a national level. So when it comes to Google's role in Europe, is there not a, a, a realization that Google, OK, fine, is doing a good job in some areas, but there is some areas of improvement to be done? Yeah, look, I mean, Think about the, the pace of change with technology and how we're all adopting it and, and how we're changing our behaviors all the time. Uh, this is incredibly fast. It'd be surprising if people didn't have questions about how the technology operates. We think deeply about those things, and we really try hard to focus on the user and make our products and services work in the user's best interest. Otherwise, we've got you know, no business, no opportunity. Uh, but we also want to make sure we listen to policymakers and people in different countries and understand how we can play a better part of it. And you know, what's great about being European, and I say this as a Brit, uh, what's great about being European is the diversity of our cultures, um, but also you know, some of the shared values that we have. And so we need to make sure that we uh, do a good job in Europe. So one example, you know, people care about privacy and security of their personal data, uh, particularly in the last couple of years in light of Snowden regulation, uh, revelations and so on. And uh, so our engineering team in Munich have built my account, which means anybody using Google can go and see what services they're opted into. They can opt out of personalization. They can opt into and out of any service. They really good transparency and control over what's going on. And that's built by our Germans. Now, the Germans, rightly and understandably, have a particular concern about the control and privacy and security of personal data. So by setting the bar to the German level on this issue, I think we're doing a good job of trying to protect everybody in the right way. And that's a good example, I think, of how we should be working more and more around the world. Mm. You mentioned the, the Snowden revelations. Another revelation we've seen this week is through the Panama Papers mm. regarding some of the, the corporate tax structures of, of companies like Apple and elsewhere. Google is not in, involved in that at all, but the, you've also seen questions being asked about your own tax structure yeah. in Europe, particularly some of the, the out of Paris and others, some of the national governments are looking for you and others to pay more tax. Yeah. And if you are going to be a good corporate citizen mm. in Europe and help the digital yeah. economy grow, is there not a 
I mean, what is your response to those who would like you to pay more into to national coffers? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we face lots of scrutin scrutiny on this, as you've seen in the headlines and also from, from policymakers. You know, obviously, we pay the taxes we're required to pay everywhere, of course, just like, uh, you know, everybody in the, in the room. There's two ways we can pay more tax. One is we can grow, which, you know, we're keen to do, investing more directly in people, but also helping all the businesses here grow. You know, our revenue comes from people spending money, reaching audiences and selling products. So we only grow when our customers and partners are growing by more. So uh, we can grow. And the second thing we can do is we can have a simplification of the tax rules and politicians can define the rules and they should do. Uh, and we and everybody else should comply with them. So we're focused on making sure that the system is clear and that we can show that we're being, uh, you know, we're playing our part. But the biggest contribution we make is products and services that are used by billions of people and millions of businesses every day to help get information, find products at the right prices, uh, to grow and export if you're a business. You know, businesses that are online are growing faster, exporting more and creating more jobs. And that's a huge opportunity. And again, I'd say we're at a moment in time. The internet population is going to double uh, and a developer here can access a couple of billion people through Android today, uh, you know, potentially several billion more through different platforms in the future. That's a huge opportunity for European businesses, both tech businesses and everyday businesses to grow. Mm. So I'm glad you mentioned Android. I'm going to use this clicker. Hopefully it works. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, did it work? Oh. Great. Um, so Android, you mentioned it yourself. Yeah. Three out of four people in this room will be using it now if, if the stats are correct. Yeah. When it comes to Android, though, there are also our questions regarding the role of Google and how that plays into your other businesses. Yeah. I use Android myself. It's, it obviously is a service that many people use. But what it then is your response to, for example, again, regulators are questioning, and the European Commission have brought charges saying that you're using the Android system to benefit your, your own services over others, potentially. Sure. I mean, I think what I'd encourage you to do is, is, you know, is look at the, the facts. Android is incredibly popular. It's open source operating system. It means that there is something in excess of 24,000 different types of device that you can get on Android from hundreds of different manufacturers on hundreds of different telcos and networks all around the world. And you can buy a, a device that can do pretty much what your high-end fruit-based device can do uh, for as little as $50. You can buy high-end devices uh, for hundreds of dollars. Uh, so Android has brought choice and competition to the world of the smartphone like nothing else. Uh, and I'm really proud of what we've done uh, for consumers, but also for app developers. You know, there are, the app economy in Europe is worth something like 1.6 million jobs. 1.3 million or more of them are heavily associated with Android. And a developer now can build one app that can reach you know, a couple of million people through uh, the Android platform. That's huge opportunity. Questions asked about Google, how it operates. Is this like the, you know, the bundling and other things we've seen in the past on, online? I'd say, well, just look again at the, the simple facts. How long does it take you to replace Google Search on an Android phone if it's got it pre-installed with something else? 30 seconds. You can remove the search widget, and you can put somebody else in. 30 seconds. But how many people do that? Well, people have the choice to do that. And many, actually, many devices that are sold have a bundle of Google apps, but also a bundle of Samsung and other apps as well. So you usually come with pre-installed apps that give you choice in every respect. And uh, then, ultimately, people have got choice, and there's competition. So as with other issues, I'm really happy for us to uh, you know, be challenged and engage with uh, policymakers and try to show what's happening uh, with Android. I believe it gives a platform which um, helps developers in a way that's never been possible before. It's hugely popular. It's open source. We don't control it. Uh, we want our apps to be popular on Android as well. Um, but ultimately, this is what's going to connect the next three or four billion people. And um, there's never been a more competitive time, I think, uh, and a bigger opportunity for entrepreneurs. I'd say today it's probably unique in history as being the best time possible to be an entrepreneur. If you've got an idea and a smartphone, you can reach 3.5 billion people. And within a couple of years, you can reach 5 billion people, uh, whether you are selling shoes or whether you're selling software as a service. That's an enormous opportunity. Mm. I was in, um, in East Africa earlier this year for a story, and, and you look at the picking up an Android phone for 20, 30 bucks, right? There is yeah. an opportunity there. But when it comes to that, you, um, Alphabet also recently, earlier this year, bought the R&D division of HTC mm -hmm. to move progressively more into, into the, the hardware business. So, so if you are now going to be both offering the, the sort of open source software, but also offering a potential product that competes with some of the people who want to use that, is that not a conflict of interest? 
Well, I think, you know, and Android's got to the scale now where lots of people are investing in making devices. And I think that the fact we're making some higher end devices shows what Android can do on high end devices. It doesn't stop Samsung making fantastic devices uh, too. I think it's just fueling innovation and competition that's ultimately good for the consumer. Uh, and it's good for the app developer, the content creator, and the business that wants to use the smartphone to connect with 5 billion people. So I think it's, it shows you the competition that's in that ecosystem. So the idea that Alphabet, Google, however it is, is moving more into the hardware business and using the operating system Android, that doesn't represent a conflict for you? I don't think so, because there's lots of people who are, you know, Android's open source. There are lots of people who are using Android in all kinds of different ways. Some of them make devices with, like, no Google stuff on it at all. Amazon's one of them, for example. Lots of Chinese manufacturers yeah. are a part of it. And it shows you the, the level of competition uh, that's there and the level of innovation that's possible. As I say, that, I think, benefits consumers immensely. Mm. So this is a bit of a whirlwind tour of Google operations in, in Europe. The next thing we're going to be talking about is the sort of the, the word of 2017, supposedly, sort of fake news. That's two words. Uh, that's true. That's a fair, fair point. So I'm going to move on to, to this. Yeah. So we had, there was a lot of discussion yesterday, both yeah. in this uh, room and in, in the other panels, regarding misinformation, the use of news, uh, both in political campaigns and also in our daily lives. We saw it last week with the US um, congressional hearings, you know, both yourselves, Facebook and Twitter were asked some pretty hard questions, and the, the what came from from Google side was the 18 YouTube channels linked to Russian-backed actors, 1,100 uh, videos uploaded, 300 views of, of that. That was the U.S. We're here in Europe. Mm -hmm. it, would it be fair to say that the similar activities that were going on in the U.S. may have happened during the the, the, the election se um, season this year in Europe. Yeah, I mean, so you, you've got a broad set of topics there. What I would say, there's you know, two key things I think we're focused on. One is um, you know, misrepresentation and spammy content. This has always been a problem on the internet, and we've been fighting it for a very long time, and we continue to fight it. In the context of news, specifically, we need to try to make sure that we can find and, and you know, act, take out the bad actors. Um, the most obvious kind of fake news you know, phenomenon that is really new is the Macedonian village publishing websites that purport to be US news websites. What, you can, what we do there is, uh, firstly, remove the incentive financially. So by tightening up our policies on AdSense and enforcement, to, 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 you know, to take away the opportunity for them to, to make money from advertising on their sites. You may not know this, but you know, AdSense, wildly popular. We pay out uh, 11 billion in 2016 to publishers of websites, helping them to make money in ways that weren't possible before. But the bar for getting in that program is high, right? It's uh, about 12% of people qualify. Uh, we took out 100,000 sites from AdSense uh, last year. We took down 1.7 billion bad ads. We took 300 million videos out of monetization. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we do to try to stop the bad. On the other end of the spectrum, it's really important that quality content, authoritative content, can be found and flourish. I think one of the encouraging things I see is actually that we some, I think over in an average month, uh, 10 billion clicks from Google go through to publishers' websites around news topics. And we've been running Google News since 2001, so 16 years working now with 80,000 news publishers who are who they say they are. Uh, and when somebody's researching a news story, that's where you get connected to 10 billion times a month. So helping quality content find a market. Now, it's also true, and you, I, I worked in news publishing before Google uh, 11 plus years ago, and, and you, know, you, you know what it's like. It's a challenging time. It's probably never been a more interesting time to be in journalism. It's also a challenging time for the traditional business model. So we've been trying to work over the last three years since I took this role with the Digital News Initiative, working with publishers to help them make the shift to this mobile-first digital world, helping them with accelerated mobile pages, open source, millions published a day, means your, your content loads faster on mobile. Helping them now look at subscription models, because I think that's one of the things that's a big gap for news is, is micropayments and subscriptions could be more popular. There's more to do there. I'm working on that. And, and you know, the picture here shows our digital news initiative, uh, hundreds of publishers coming together across Europe. Uh, we've also made grants in excess of 70 million euros to publishers in every single country to help them innovate and experiment at a time when their business models are, are challenged with how they tell stories. So I hope that you can see that both on quality content flourishing, but also spammy, bad actor content being reduced. We're trying our, uh, you know, our best in partnership with others 
to make the web work for everyone and ensure that quality content can be found. But when it comes to the misinformation, is it not a question of whack-a-mole? You can do whatever you want, tweak the AdSense, mm -hmm. look at taking down channels from, from YouTube, but the, the fake news phenomena, however you want to define it, is progressively changing. Yeah, I think that's right. And you know, this, is, this has long been the story. I mean, this is not going to be something where you know, there's some kind of magical technical solution and, and, and everything's fixed. And the overwhelming positive of five billion people you know, connected and everyone having in their pocket a device that can make them a publisher, that's fantastic. But if everybody's a publisher, you know, then some people are going to, just like in the real world, some people are going to do that for nefarious reasons. It's a, it's a small scale problem, actually, but it is a problem. And the fact that now social media and other platforms allow you to grow the audience for that content, that's a challenge. One advantage I think we have at Google is that generally when you come to Google, you're asking us a question about a topic. And so that really helps us to make sure we field you quality content and the right answers. We don't always get it right. And actually working with authorities and experts on things like violent extremist content, uh, we're making significant progress in stopping illegal and violent content getting to users at all. But you're absolutely right. It's something where we need to con continue to invest and actually work with policymakers and lawmakers. I saw the head of Europol outside. You know, that, you know, th there's a lot of work going on. We've made a, a couple of grants recently to help NGOs get more involved in this area. Um, and, and there's more work to do. But when it comes to hate speech, which is obviously slightly different than misinformation, there is a push, particularly from the Europeans, to demand that yourselves, Facebook, et cetera, take greater responsibility yeah. for what is published on your site. There is a sense of that you're not a tech company. YouTube is a, is a publishing platform. Therefore, mm. Alpha, Google, Facebook, Twitter, whoever it is, should be seen as a publisher, not just a tech company. Yeah, and I think look, it's, it, if you think about what a publisher does, right? You know, you're commissioning 90 or 100 stories a day, uh, editorial control, and putting it on a platform. If you think about what YouTube does, 400 hours of content are uploaded every minute, uh, a billion hours a day are watched on YouTube. It's, it's clearly not the same as a publisher. But it doesn't mean to say we don't have responsibilities. Right? We have responsibilities that we take seriously. We want to make sure that there isn't any illegal uh, or hateful content on YouTube. We have clear po content policies. And, and it's true uh, that we haven't always got that right. So in recent months, and we've published blogs updating on our progress on this, we used a combination of uh, better technology and more people to identify and remove harmful content, violent extremist content, fast. I think we're now in, the, in excess of 80% of vinyl, violent extremist content that we remove is now removed before a single human flag. So we made huge progress there. Uh, we also need to work with experts. So we work with NGOs and law enforcers, and we've added another 35 of them to our program because experts can identify much more accurately what needs to be done. Uh, we also have raised our standards. And there's a, a debate here. You know, it's not clear to me that you want the technology companies to be the people who decide, decide the standards. You actually want the lawmakers to do that. So we actually engage uh, very constructively with governments. I've personally attended the EU Internet Forum uh, for the last two years, and I'll be going again in December to talk to the security ministers in the EU. Modeled on the success of that forum has been the Global Internet Security Forum, which has uh, taken place for the first time in New York a couple of uh, months ago. So again, I think this shows how where technology and regulations can come together, we can make a difference in some of these difficult areas. And finally, we're going to move on to uh, an issue that maybe people in the audience want to know about is digital skills yeah. when it comes to what you and others can offer. If I'm a coder sitting in the room here or someone who wants to get into the digital world, why is Google the right place to come to for that? Why wouldn't I go to my local university or someone else to, to offer me that? Yeah, look, this is something I'm personally really passionate about. Uh, about three, four years ago, I saw a report the EU has published that said that you know, half of jobs are going to need some kind of a digital skill. It said that a million uh, jobs are going to go unfilled because of a lack of digital skills. And clearly, there's a need to arm the population with the skills that can help them make the most of this great technology. So we set ourselves a challenge to train a million Europeans in basic digital skills in two years. And I'm talking about like, how to use online marketing, analytics, those kinds of skills that you can apply in a productive economic way. And um, we were blown away by demand. So uh, we have now trained over 3 million Europeans and nearly 5.6 million people across the Europe, Middle East and Africa, always in partnership. In each country where we've uh, done this program, we've done it in every European country, 46 countries in total. We've done it in partnership with governments and experts trying to bring the right skills to the right people. So here in Portugal, particularly targeting youth unemployment, uh, which has been a, a big problem. Um, as I say, blown away by demand, a couple of in encouraging things. Where we didn't have youth-targeted programs, the average age of people 
participating has been over 40, uh, and it's been 47% female. So what it suggests is there's real demand for the digital skills that can help everyday businesses grow and succeed. Um, and we've now started to try to understand what's the economic impact of that training, because it it's all very well to say, well, you know, you've come to the training. On average, these people have done four plus hours of training. In some cases, they've done eight month programs on Android coding. So it varies quite a bit. Um, and what we've seen is that we've got hundreds of thousands of people who've got better jobs, changed jobs or started businesses as a result. And uh, many, many, I think 30,000 plus small businesses who are reporting extra growth as a result. And it's just our way of trying to play our part because you've got to ask the question, why isn't there a European Google? Right? Why isn't there you know, these big these But big, that's not uh, the right, stories? I mean, for me, that's not the right question. It's a question of, there's, there's a reason why there's no European Google, because the market at the moment isn't as big as the US. But I suppose my question is, the US, China, and others are moving forward quite quickly. And as much as you can train 3 million people, and that's a good start, how are you, is that enough right. to, 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 to keep up with the other yeah. parts of the world that are doing so, similar things? I mean, I would agree. I think. The internet population is set to double. We're going to be 5 billion, 10 billion people online. How are we going to succeed in Europe in this world? I don't think there's any difference in the talent here. You know, I, I spent last night with, with 15 uh, Portuguese entrepreneurs. They've got as good an idea and as capable people as any you meet anywhere in the world. I don't think there's a problem with access to finance. It's not as easy as sitting at a cafe in Palo Alto, but it's not that difficult to get finance. We just heard from Klaus Hommels and others on stage. But I do think the kind of route to scale and ambition is a challenge in Europe. That's why I really support, it's great to see commissioners coming here, um, listening to the tech industry about how digital single market can work. Right, so if you start building in Portugal, you shouldn't build for 10 million people. You should build for 500 million Europeans and 5 billion people connected. Think from the word go about that global market. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do. So uh, I'm proud of the way our platforms help you to do that. Small businesses using search to grow around the world, selling your shoes to anyone searching for shoes. How app developers can do that with Play, content creators on YouTube, and many of the people here using you know, tools that we and others make available. But there is this moment where we need to skill up and think big about the opportunity in front of Europe. And so you know, we want to play our part doing that. I think we've got the talent. I think we've got the ideas. But the route to scale and the ambition is what we need more of. And that's why it's so great to see the Web Summit getting traction like this. And I'm really pleased to, to you know, spend time with our entrepreneurs here. I would say there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. If not, now when? Otherwise, the Chinese are coming. The Americans are here. And there's an opportunity for all of us uh, to play our part in being successful in Europe. That's great. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.